Good morning, Queensland. Welcome to the, the 2021 Census Data Seminar. Uh, really looking forward to sharing some of the, the insights we've seen from Census Data about Queensland today. Um, I'm joining you though, not from Queensland, unfortunately. I'm at home in Tasmania. I'd like to acknowledge the Palawa people. Um, They've had an age old connection here in Hobart to the, the lands, the seas, the, the waterways. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past and present, but I'd also like to extend my acknowledgement to all of the traditional owners of the lands that everyone's joining us from today eh, for this session and pass on a, a special warm welcome to any members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community that have tuned in to today's session. So, my name is Duncan Young. I have a, a, what I think is one of the best jobs in Australia, the general manager of a census um, division and the census program for Australia. And the, our other key presenter today is Caroline Deans, uh, a Brisbane local, who's the director of 2021 census dissemination. And so to, between us, we'll share a range of insights on the data today, but also provide some opportunities for questions. So a, a bit of a run through of today's session, I'll give you a bit of background about the 2021 census, about conducting the census during a pandemic and how that, that affected both the way we went about the census and what we've seen in the data. Um, the response rates from the census and some of the key quality indicators that help you understand and the, the data that we've collected. And then we'll get into the key data insights, which we're really looking forward to. Then we'll talk about out for release timeline for more or information coming out from a census, as well as how do you access the data that we've already made available. And then lots of time for some questions. So how do you ask questions in the streaming world? Well, you just need to go to www.polev.com forward slash 2021 census DS data seminar QLD Queensland. And so if you go to that URL, oh, you'll be able to put in your questions there. Um, that URL will be in the top right hand corner of all of the slides today. So if you didn't capture it, you'll be able to capture it as you go along. It works really well on your mobile phone or on um, your browser and so submit your questions in and they'll get read out to us at the end and we'll get through as many of them as we can. So conducting a census is a, um, it's a fascinating challenge. It's, we think that the largest peacetime operation in Australia, um, as you can see on this slide, but there's some big numbers there when you're running a census. It's a big logistical operation to get out to Australia's 11 million dwellings and get census forms back from 25 million people. Um, we employed approximately 35,000 staff. So do want, that's sort of bigger than Gladstone half the size of Mackay. I, not that we employed everyone in Gladstone, we, we sort of spread it across the country, but to give you a bit of a size of a magnitude, um, we're reducing the amount of paper with the online form becoming more and more prominent, but we still had 60 million pages of paper census forms scanned. And if we'd piled them all up in one pile, which would have been quite a fun exercise to do, it would have gone six kilometres high or about three times the height of Mount Kosciuszko. Um, and for the first time, we had a chatbot join the census program. So we re recruited the lovely Claire, our chatbot, and she had 375 conversations on the census um, during census year. Slightly less than me, but did a lot of talking about the census. But the census in 2021 was quite unique because of the, uh, the pandemic that we've all been, been challenged by in Australia. And, and obviously the census, um, occurred in the second year of a pandemic. And for Queensland, um, most of the councils in South East Queensland had been in lockdown just before census and came out of, of lockdown the Sunday before census night. And then Cairns and Yarrabah went into lockdown on, um, on census night I'd for three days there. So it was certainly a big effect of lockdowns at that time. Um, and in totality, about half of the country were in lockdown at some stage during the census collection period. Um, my say this probably gave us a few gray hairs in the lead up to census and thinking about how the census was gonna run and, and would this allow um, impact us negatively 
in running the census. And it certainly posed some challenges. We needed to adapt our approaches to make sure that we kept our staff safe, but also kept the community safe during the census, but also still allowing everyone easy opportunities to, to participate in the census. Um, but uh, to, what actually happened was we, we've seen some a, an increase in response rate across the country. So maybe people being in lockdown didn't have much else to do and they got on and, and did their census forms. Um, we also saw um, it, some of the changes which occurred during the whole pandemic have probably meant that the census data gives us a really unique, complete picture of a country. So usually at census time, we miss out on some rich detail of Australians which are traveling overseas. 2016, 600,000 people were overseas on, on census night, right? whereas in 2021, it was something a little bit less than 40,000. So that's 560,000 Australians who are now fully included in the census count because they were back at home in Australia. In addition, um, less people were travelling away from home for, for work or for holidays at census time, which means that at, they're back with their, their family homes, which gives us a richer um, usual residence picture of a country. But there will, are some key differences in the, some of the data that we produce for due to COVID-19. In particular, people who look at the um, census night count, which isn't the or what we call the as enumerated count of a country. And so that count um, isn't the main, main release and all of the numbers we'll talk about today are about usual residents. But that number does give people a different picture and a picture of where people are in August, on August the 10th. And for, particularly for some of the tourist areas in, in Queensland, they would have seen um, in previous censuses, a lot of people like myself from Tassie getting up for warmer weather uh, at census time, and there'll be less of that ad featured in the data this time. But that, uh, just to, to repeat, that doesn't affect our usual residence data, that doesn't uh, affect our estimates of resident population, which are all based not on where you were on census night, but on where you usually live, which has always been one of the questions we ask um, people in the census. So to, uh, as I've sort of alluded to already, a, we're really proud of this census and the, the quality of the data in this census. So to, um, we, we aim to get a high response rate in the census. This is trying to get as many a, private dwellings in Australia to complete a census form. So we get a full picture of that household, not just an estimate of how many people live there. And so what you can see on this slide is that we've got over 96% for Australia. That's more than 1% more than what we saw in 2016. And in Queensland, Good work, guys. Thanks. Thanks. 96.8% response rate in Queensland. So smashed that national kind of number. So that's a fantastic picture. Um, in, in addition to making sure that uh, there's many people fill out forms as possible, we want to make sure that the census hasn't missed people or hasn't counted people more than once. And so to do that, we go out to 50,000 households after a census and do an actual interview with them. We send out our trained interviewers or do interviews over a telephone to try and work out where does the census miss people? Where do we count people in the wrong place? Where do we count people more than once? Who's filled out more than one form? Because I love the census so much. And so to, uh, with this, we get a measure of how much does the final census count undercount or overcount the population. And you can see here that at Australia level, an undercount of 0.7%, that's the lowest we've ever seen. So the closest we've ever had an alignment between the census count and the estimated resident population. And the Queensland net undercount is slightly higher than Australia, but that's still a reduction from, from 2016 and a fantastic figure. And then the other element of the quality of our census data is actually, and this surprises a few people, when people fill out their census form online, we actually get higher quality data. Uh, the online form helps guide people to the right questions, helps remind people if a question's blank, and um, helps them also to, with prompting questions to some of our questions along the way. And so an increase in online response is an increase in quality. And so we've seen this increase from um, 
10 percent back in 2006 to 33 percent in 2011 to about 60 percent in 2016 up now to about 80 percent and very similar numbers in both across australia and in queensland so we're really pleased with it, the data that we have from your census and know that it's of very high quality okay well what what does the data actually show let's get into some of the data we're going to start with sort of some people kind of levels nationally. And so this census counted 25,422,788 usual residents in Australia. So an increase of about 8.6% since um, 2016. Some people thought actually the population probably stalled or went backwards because of COVID and because of border closures. But Remember that between 2016 and 2021, we had um, three and a half blissful years, which we didn't even realise were blissful at the time, pre-pandemic conditions. And then it was the last year and a half uh, or a little bit more where we we're in the pandemic conditions. So there was still, as Caroline will highlight to you a bit later on, still quite a bit of migration into Australia during that period of time, but also, um, continual or births within the country. And so this picture shows the percentage increase of population state by state. So a really healthy 9.6% growth in Queensland, not the fastest growing jurisdiction in the country. You've landed just behind Victoria and yet yeah, a little bit behind those show offs in the ACT, which had a 14.4% growth. And they've held the title twice in a row there. Watch out for Tasmania. Tasmania was the slowest growth five years ago, and it's nearly caught you at 9.3% growth. So we must be doing something right down here in Tassie. Um, so let, let's, we're not here to hear about my state, Bo. We're here to hear about Queensland. So let's step in a little bit more into Queensland. And so this shows that 9.6% growth since 2016 with 5,156,138 people counted in Queensland. 11% growth from 2011. And when you wind back to, to looking at 1971, just 50 years ago, oh, oh, Queensland has more than tripled its population. Um, in the same time period, Australia has only doubled its population. So Queensland is certainly growing faster and a greater share of Australians are living in Queensland over the course of the last five years. Um, we can get into a little bit more detail. So this um, is a breakup of Australia, of Australia, no, of Queensland into SA threes, statistical area threes, which are, are, are regions that we've we sort of designed to allow our to break down our statistics and comparison across the state. Now, uh, like most states, for majority of a population and are um, in the, the capital city, well, actually in Queensland, it's slightly less than 50% of the population are in the greater Brisbane area. Um, it, if you add Gold Coast, you're up over 60%. If you add Sunshine Coast, you're up near 70% of the Queensland population. And across Australia as a whole, two thirds of a population live in capital cities and a third live outside. So uh, sort of a similar kind of picture happens in Queensland between the, the southeast and, and the rest of the state in terms of population distribution, which um, obviously it makes for for the SA threes are much smaller when it comes to that southeast corner. And so we'll zoom in there in a little bit. But on the, the picture on my left here is showing population change. And so green is showing areas where the population has decreased over the last five years. Um, for sort of pale kind of color is a slight I decrease up to sort of a 0% change. And the orange is where the increase is. And so, um, you can see here there's declines in population counted in the far north, in Charters Towers and in the outback areas. But um, growth in Port Douglas Daintree, growth in Tablelands Coranda, um, growth in Cairns North, Mackay and Mabowan Basin, including um, but with Sundays uh, and Early Beach. So to, uh, some growth and some declines across the country. On the right there, you can see that the dwellings change. And so the dwellings, um, you don't expect to see the same kind of decline zones in dwellings. Um, so do, you don't sort of see the green there, but you see a growth in orange and in sort of similar areas and primarily down in the, the southeast corner. 
let's um let's look a little bit closer about southeast corner now. So zooming in here, here on the map. Um, so to, there are no areas of decline in either population or dwellings across the southeast corner. But sort of lower growth areas in Centenary with only one and a half percent, Sunnybank 0.8 percent, and Springwood Kingston 2.3 percent, and very different to some of the really high growth areas. So Brisbane Inner at 29 percent growth, or Jimboomba 35 percent growth, Ormeo Oxenford 31 percent growth, North Lakes 23 percent growth. So some quite big growths and. We see quite similar growths for, for number of dwellings in these areas too. So Brisbane Inner, I mentioned, was a 29% growth. It had a 40% growth in dwellings in that period of time. Jimboomba, 35% population growth, 33% dwelling growth. Most of the Gold Coast has increased um, in population by about 5 to 10% over the last five years. So some areas slightly below the state, aid, aid some areas slightly above. Um, yeah, to have, what we have seen in and do see this census for the first time is we've started releasing data on people who are living in dwellings of over nine storeys. It's the first time we've had that data in the census, so it gives us a little bit of a new picture and we can see across Australia now over half a million people living in um, these sort of more high rise kind of dwellings. And unsurprisingly, on the Gold Coast, there's some six and a half thousand flats and apartments in nine and a half storey buildings and an area of growth. And the growth of dwellings and apartments is outstripping the growth in houses in most of our um, city areas. Enough from me, I'll hand over to Caroline. Thank you very much, Duncan, and good, good morning, everyone. I, I'm going to continue the story of talking about the population of Queensland. But before I do that, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today. I'm joining you from Canberra, so I'm on Ngunnawal lands today, but my hometown is Brisbane, so I would acknowledge the, the Turrbal people uh, in the Brisbane area and no doubt many of you are joining from Brisbane and in fact throughout Queensland. Let me start with a population pyramid, um, something that's in always in a demographer's toolkit and this one I've got up here and I'll talk you through it is from 2001. So if, if this is something you don't normally use, let me, let me explain what we're looking at here. On the left side of that graph, we see the proportion of males in five-year age cohorts, starting from zero to four down the bottom and up to 85 plus at the top. And each bar represents the proportion of the total population that the, that age and sex cohort uh, represents. And on the right, we can see the same thing for, for females. So quite an interesting pattern in Queensland. We've been looking at these for all states and there's always something interesting to see in a, in a population pyramid. And what, what was interesting in the 2001 Queensland population pyramid was there's actually quite a number of young people. Um, and that's not a pattern we see in most of the other the states. So the biggest group, proportionate group for males in Queensland were the 5 to 9, 10 to 14 and 15 to 19 year olds. You can see that down the bottom there and the 40 to 44 year olds. Each of those age cohorts represented 3.7% of all people in Queensland. In females, a little bit of a different picture. The um, dominant groups are at the 35 to 39 and 40 to 44, and they're both 3.8. Folks, I got on the screen there the median age for Queensland, it was 35 uh, back in 2001, and that's the same as what Australia was then. So enough about the past, let's go forward to 2021. And on this pyramid, I'm going to overlay in that is teal colours, the um, population pyramid for 2021. And what we can see there is a bit more flattening of the, the pyramid. And a large proportion of where we're seeing changes is at the upper end. So if you look at everything from the 60-year-old bracket upwards, um, there's more, the, the teal bars are larger, both for males and females. We do still see, though, in a quite a 
a large number of younger people. And so for males, the largest group continues to be the 10 to 14 year olds and also the 35 to 39 year olds and female similar pattern to what we saw 20 years ago the, the dominant group is the 35 to 39 year olds Queensland is a very big state a very diverse state and so where we've got these um, observations for Queensland as a whole it doesn't necessarily reflect in each of the local local areas so if we look at Queensland's median age in 2021 it was 38 which is the same as the Australian median age. But if I have a look at some local areas, and you might not be surprised by this, but some areas with high median ages, Bribie Beachmere, uh, 59 years median age, um, Harvey Bay, 51, Maryborough, also 51, and the Noosa Hinterland, 49. So not at all surprised that those are beautiful places for people to retire to and much higher median ages in those locations compared to the whole of Queensland. And then at the opposite end of the scale, the youngest area is Springfield Red Bank, uh, where the median age is 31 years old. And when we look at that, there's uh, lots of families that living in that area, lots of families with kids under 10, and the parents are uh, in their 30s. And they're both couple families with children, but also lone parent families with children. And when I was drilling into this particular population, I was having a look that there's a, quite a large proportion of people who identify with having a Samoan ancestry in that Springfield Red Bank area. Uh, 6% of people living in that area identify with a Samoan ancestry compared to 0.7% in Queensland as a whole. And I will talk more about cultural diversity, but I just was very interested in what I was seeing in Springfield. So I had a look into it there. So moving away from the population pyramid, and let me just explain to you uh, when we talk about sex in the census, we I've just been talking about male and female sex. Some of you may remember when you completed your census form last year that there was actually another response option. There was a response option called non-binary sex to allow for people who couldn't answer with either male or female to be able to answer answer that question. and But in our data releases, we are releasing data as male and as female. And that's because um, we didn't actually ask a gender question. We didn't ask a question about gender identity. And when you ask only the sex question on its own the way we did, the responses that you get for that non-binary sex are a little bit confused. So we're not um, putting that in our general releases because we're worried about people misinterpreting that data. What we're doing instead is in a couple of months' time, we're going to be releasing an analytical article that will describe what we saw with those people who responded as non-binary sex. So don't be confused when you look at the data, we only are reporting on male and female. Now I'm going to talk about the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population of, of Queensland. And starting off just with a infographic showing how things have changed over the last 10 years. And these are, again, Queensland numbers. And you can see on the right of the screen, we had about 237 people identified, uh, sorry, 237,000 people identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander in Queensland. And that represented 4.6% of the total population. That was a growth of about 27% on the previous census, which in itself was a growth of nearly 20% on the 2011 census. And when I just look at the, that proportion that we see, that 4.6%, that, that compares to an Australian rate of identification of 3.2%. So much higher rate of identification of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Queensland. And the next slide does show that breakdown by state. 
And so you can see there in that shaded bit, there are the counts of people in each of the states. So the largest number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, continue to be in New South Wales with nearly 280,000. And then Queensland is that little bit lower at 237,000. As I said, the Queensland proportion is 4.6%. New South Wales, because it's a much larger population, they're 3.4%. And while only, um, if we look at the Northern Territory, there's just over 60,000 people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander origin uh, living in the, in the Territory, which is about 7.5% of the total Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population in Australia. But that actually represents 26% or over 26% of the, the Territory's population. I think what's also interesting to look at on this chart is uh, the growth rates over over time. Um, and I said Queensland was growing at 27% uh, on the previous census. And that final column on that table does show that percentage growth rate for all states and for Australia. So Australia was 25.2% growth, Queensland just a little bit ahead of that. But we did see very large increases in Victoria and the Australian Capital Territory in particular off a lower base, but uh, growth rates are in the order of 37% there. And at the other extreme, the growth rate in the Northern Territory was much lower at 4.9%. This next slide uh, breaks down uh, how people have identified. So the question we ask is, are you of Aboriginal origin, Torres Strait Islander origin, or, or both? And so this is the breakdown for Queensland. And the majority of people, uh, 193,000 uh, people in Queensland who identified as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander were identified as Aboriginal only. Lower numbers there, about 20,000 each of Torres Strait Islander on its own, or both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. And again, when we look at the right of that chart, you can see that the, the growth in that population has predominantly been growth in the um, Aboriginal population. And bringing up a, a map, um, like Duncan was showing earlier, this is the, a map showing the SA3s, um, so Statistical Area 3 boundaries. And um, the darker colour there, up in the Cape York, not surprisingly, is the part of the state with the highest rate of identification of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. And that was a rate of 51.3%. And it's not, in fact, the highest rate in the country. Um, it is higher than Kimberley and Catherine, um, but it's not as high as the rates that we observed in East and West, West Arnhem. And that top end population in Queensland, that far north population in Queensland, represents 7% of the total Indigenous population in Queensland. And you can see also in the northwest a relatively high rate as well. And then as we head down to the south, inland the rate is a little bit higher um, of at least 8%. And then in the coastal areas, lower, uh, generally about 3% in those coastal areas, which is that lighter shade that you're seeing all the way down the, down the coast. And let's just have a look in at the southeast corner, and you can see there that the rates are much, much lower. Uh, where we do see differences is the outer suburbs there generally have slightly higher rates in that metropolitan area, so a bit higher in Ipswich and Strathpine and Ben Lee, and most of the um, Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast um, SA3s are also relatively low. So let's look at that population change over a longer time period. This chart here is going back to 1991. And you can see there on the left, that is the count of people, the count of people who have identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander in the, the last 30, 30 years. You can see it's gone from 70,000 to um, over three times that at 230,000. 
7,000. On the right is the proportion of a population which hasn't even doubled because, as Duncan said earlier, the rate of growth of the Queensland population has been uh, very high. So the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have really increased, but the rate um, has increased at a, a lesser amount. And final slide talking about the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population is looking at an age distribution, uh, this time of 2021 compared to 10 years ago in 2011. And we see that the dark orange bars there are the most recent year and the lighter peach coloured bars are 10, 10 years ago. And what you can see there is greater proportions of people at the higher age group. So everywhere from 45 up, there are more, the greater proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and fewer at some of those lower, lower age groups. And that's reflected in the um, median age, which has increased from 20 years in 2011 to 23 years in 2021. So let's move on now to talk about other, other observations of cultural diversity that we can get from the census. And we ask a lot of questions on the census to try and understand the, the cultural makeup of, of our communities. We ask about countries that you were born in, uh, where your parents were born, uh, the languages that you use at home, ancestry, and also about religious affiliation. So quite a, a breadth of data is collected on cultural diversity. And I'm just going to share some of those observations today. Starting with a pie chart, uh, which is describing or splitting up Australia or Queensland, I'm sorry, into first generation, second generation and third or more generation. So first generation are those people who are currently living in Queensland, but they were born overseas. And that you can see the bottom right there, 18.9% of Queenslanders could be described as first generation. Second generation are those who have um, one or both parents were born overseas. And so that's making up another 24% uh, of the, the pie. And the third generation, which is really the dominant group here, um, is people who are in Queensland who, are, who were born in Australia and had both of their parents born in Australia, 56.9%. Now, when we look at Australia as a whole and just about every other state, that split actually goes the other way. So we see in Queensland a lot more people both born in Australia themselves and with their parents born in Australia. So for the people who do come from overseas, what are the, the top countries of, of birth? Well, 71.4% were born in Australia. And then the next few countries, um, as you can see there, are New Zealand, England, India, China, and then, then the Philippines. So that's the, sim that's the same countries that we see making up the, the top five in Australia, but they're in a different order. And probably not surprisingly, New Zealand um, is 4% of the Queensland population were born in New Zealand. So over, over 200,000. And when we look at uh, when people arrive in the country, so that's another piece of information we collect on the census for people who were born overseas, what year did they arrive in Australia? Looking back all of this century in the last, you know, in the 90s and the late 80s, there's been a fairly consistent stream of people arriving from New Zealand. So it's not a recent surge, it's just a fairly constant rate of people arriving from New Zealand over the last uh, 30 years or, or so. Not showing here in our top five countries other than Australia, but one of the fastest growing population groups in Queensland is uh, people who are born in Nepal. And that population has more than doubled uh, in the last five years. So it's gone from, it's more than doubled to over 10,000, 10,800. And another large growth population in Queensland are people who are born in Brazil. And that's also doubled in the last five years, again, to a relatively small number of 12,500. 
let's break this down across the state. Again, showing that map of SA3 and the pale areas that you see across much of the, the regional area are um, lower rates of people born overseas. So in fact, less than 13% of the population in mo much of regional Queensland um, were born overseas. The few darker shaded areas that you can see there are uh, Port Douglas, Daintree and Cairns, which is about 21%, also Harvey Bay, and Toowoomba. Um, all of these regions though, their top countries of birth other than Australia are New Zealand and, and England. Picture does change a little bit as we get into the southeast corner and you can see some shaded areas there that are quite, quite dark. So the Sunnybank region, 53% uh, of people in the Sunnybank SA3 were born overseas. Rockley Acacia Ridge was also very high, just under 50%. And Mount Gravatt as well was quite high um, at 41%. And all of these three regions have China as their top country of birth outside of Australia. In the Gold Coast uh, regions, both Southport and Surfers have the higher um, proportion of people born overseas, as you can see from that dark shaded bit down in the right, bottom right corner of that, that map. Um, but all the people there are also born in New Zealand and England. So yes, as I said, we, we ask about what year people arrived in the country. Um, and we're just showing here the arrivals in the last five years or in the time since the since the last census. And these are the number of people who have arrived each year and are still currently in, in Queensland. And very subtle colour coding there to point out on the left of the screen in those two bars, pre-pandemic and then a different picture as we get to the right, which is the area of the pandemic where arrivals from overseas really, really decreased. So there was a large number of people coming in in 2019 into Queensland, over 50,000. And that was showing actually a little, a slight increase in the proportion of people arriving in Queensland of all people arriving in Australia. So most of the first three years of that period were about 14, 15% of all arrivals into Australia ended up in Queensland. That increased in that 2019 period up to 16.3. And then when the pandemic hit, uh, we found that the rate of people coming in and landing in Queensland or sorry, staying in Queensland was actually higher. So Queensland was taking a greater share of arrivals into the country with 17.4 uh, in 2020 and also 20.1% um, last year. And I should say that last year figure is only until the 10th of August census night. So some interesting patterns that we are seeing there. Let's look at a, <clears throat> excuse me, another measure of diversity, and that's the, the languages people speak at home. In 1991, so 30 years ago, 91% of people in Queensland only spoke English at home. Um, and then the, when they spoke a language other than English at home, you can see them listed there, Italian, German, Cantonese, Greek, and Vietnamese. When we look at, at the last year's census, 2021, there's now um, the proportion speaking only English at home has decreased. So we've decreased from 91% to 80.5%. And for those who did use another language at home, the most common were Mandarin, Vietnamese, Punjabi, Spanish, and Cantonese. Now, just going to talk about religious affiliation and how that is changing over time. So on the census, we ask what uh, how people identify their religion, what, what a, a religious group they have an affiliation with and including no religion. This graph that I've got here is the Australia graph. This isn't Queensland, this is Australia as a whole, just to show at a very high level what's happened with people's religious reporting over the last 50 years. That dark orange bar on the top is all the Christianity denominations added together 
And you can see that decreasing from over 80%, nearly 90% down to 43% in the uh, 2021 census. And at the same time, we can see the no religion reflected there in the darker green colour, growing from under 10% to nearly 40%. So that's the Australia level, uh, just seeing that switch between no religion and Christianity. And coming through on the bottom in the light green uh, colour is all the other religions grouped together, and they've grown to about 10% of the, the um, total reported religions. And the final slide for me is a Queensland focus on people's religious affiliation. And the, again, we're seeing that no religion group, that darker teal colour um, is the one that's really showing an increase over the last period of time. And that's now at 41.5%. So it's a little bit higher than the Australian rate and has really increased um, over the last 20, 20 years in particular. The next three bars we see there, the uh, lighter green, peach and the yellow there, the Christian um, religion broken up into some key denominations with the, the green being Catholic, the yellow is um Anglican and that peach one coming through in the middle is other Christian and that includes people who just who report Christian as their religious affiliation and not a specific denomination. So what you can see there going back to 1986 is that uh, the proportion is decreasing. We are seeing a drop in the rate at which people are reporting affiliation with Christian religions but the numbers if because of the population growth that we have seen in Queensland, the numbers um, are actually increasing. So there's, in fact, about 440,000 more people in 2021 who reported a, a Christian religious affiliation than there was back in 1986. And right at the very bottom of the chart, which we can barely see, um, are the other religions, and they're very, very small numbers in in Queensland, in Australia, you might remember that they grouped together to be about 10%. In Queensland, this is being led by Buddhism, and that is at 1.4%. So very small proportions of people reporting those other religions, and it's probably reflecting the lower rate of people in Queensland who were born overseas. So I am going to hand over to Duncan now, who's going to take us through some data on a couple of the new questions that were in the census. Thanks, Caroline. Fantastic data. Um, as Caroline highlighted, the, the, the government of the day chooses the topics for a census. And that's probably a good thing, because if I was in charge of the topics for a census, you'd probably still be filling out your form now with over a thousand questions. But we, we're really excited. We, we did get two new questions in the census last year. A question, the first one of those that we'll focus on is a question on long-term health conditions. Now, here, here's what the question looks like on the form to, to remind you from last year. Um, yeah, we had lots of external requests and support for adding a question on long-term health conditions to the census. It's such an important piece of information for, for uh, both um, planning our services um, across the, the population, as well as considering well-being, as well as considering the impacts of the changing age profile of, of the population in Australia. Now, the, the question here, as you can see, asks, for each person in the household, have they been told by a doctor or a nurse, do they have one of these selected long-term health conditions? And we came up with this list through consultation, again, with, with key people that will be using this data. And there's also an opportunity for people to indicate that they have a different long-term health condition or no long-term health condition. Now, the ABS already collects a lot of data on health through our health surveys, the National Health Survey, the National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing. So why collect data on the census? Well, what the census does that none of those other collections do is it allows you to get really um, data that can represent smaller population groups. You can look in at, at 
smaller areas or smaller age groups or smaller age groups in a smaller area with a um, certain um, cultural background. And so by, by being able to drill into the data more, uh, you get a richness that isn't available when you do a, a national sample kind of survey. We still think that our national sample surveys are fantastic, Bo. They're, they're the, the prime data you should be using for national figures, state-based figures, is because they, they again, and like our, our post, post um, enumeration survey, they're supported by an interviewer. They can go into much more depth if, to understand the details of a condition. So it, oh, it's a real, this is a great new complement to that existing health survey data. But let's get into the data. So what we found was that 28.8%, so somewhere between one in four and one in three Queensland usual residents reported having a long-term health condition. This is actually one percentage point higher than across Australia as a whole. So 27.7% across Australia. So more long-term health, more people, a higher proportion of people have a long-term health condition in Queensland. And as you can see on the right here, for a million people. So this is about one and a half million people all up in Queensland with a long-term health condition. A million, about two thirds of that group had only one health condition, but uh, yeah, 320,000, about one in five of that group had two health conditions and about 170,000 had three or more health conditions. And when we produced the data from a census, we've grouped together certain um, health conditions together in some of our reporting to help you understand um, comorbidities, um, the things which fit together where there's a particular concern if people have both of those, those health conditions. So a really interesting way of looking at the data. Um, the long-term health condition story is a, a significant story when you look at it by age. So this is just five of the, the 10 and long-term health conditions on this slide broken down by age. And it's the proportion of each age group from zero to nine through to a hundred plus. And that's an example of something that we can't do in our surveys, look at a population of a hundred pluses, but in the census, because we're counting everyone, we've got that group and the proportion of each age group that have each of the long-term health conditions. So if we look at the, the big line on top, that's arthritis clearly the increases in the, the higher proportion of people have arthritis as you get older through to once you get to 80 years old old or so about one in three of a population have been diagnosed as having arthritis um, looking below oh, that we'll go to to di diabetes um, Diabetes is in the, the dark green or the green kind of colour there. Again, it, you can see it increases with age, but it, it peaks a little bit earlier, sort of 70 to, to 90 year age group. And um, yet diabetes, interestingly, whilst overall there's more long-term health conditions in Queensland, has a lower rate, of age, who have a lower rate of diabetes in Queensland than in Australia, 4.5% rather than 4.7%. Um, Heart disease is the purple line that, that jumps out above of diabetes there. And so again, increases with age and it's really in that 80 to 100 plus that it becomes really present. But remember there's bigger population groups in those younger age groups. So there's a lot of people in those age groups. So 10% um, of people 60 to 69 year olds have um, heart disease. That, that's a lot of people in the community, in the Queensland community. Heart disease like diabetes is has a lower rate in Queensland than the rest of Australia, 4.2% compared to 4.9%. A um, couple of lines which follow a different pattern when it comes to age, age now. Um, asthma is the yellow line, and which you can see is pretty steady there across the picture. So it, asthma it, um, is one of the few conditions reported by a large number of zero to nine year olds and is um, yet then even bigger with, with 10 to 19 year olds. And in Queensland, but there is more people with asthma reported than in the rest of Australia, eight and a half percent compared to 8.1 percent. Probably the one which stood out for me when I looked at Queensland data was a mental health conditions line. So firstly, the, the mental health conditions line is a different shape again, and it has a peak point at 20 to 29 years. And it's the most common condition all the way through from, from 10 to, to 50 as a long-term health condition for our population. 
But in Queensland, nearly half a million Queenslanders reported having a mental health condition. So that's one in 10 Queenslanders. And this is nearly a full percentage point higher than the national average, unfortunately. So let's, um, let's drill in a little bit more on mental health conditions. This again is the, the whole of Queensland broken down into the, um, the statistical areas. Um, you can see here that there's actually much lower rates of mental health conditions reported in the far north and the northwest, 3.3% and 4.9% respectively. Whereas in Townsville and Rockhampton, um, it's up over 10%. And then in the Wide Bay Burnett region, it's 13.4%, um, so nearly one in seven in that region. But if we zoom in to, to the southeast um, Queensland and corner, then um, you can see here that our colours get much darker, meaning that there's a lot higher proportion rates of reported um, mental health conditions. And so Ipswich, at one in seven people, 13.6%. Bow Desert and Beanley at about 12%, so much higher kind of proportions of a population reporting mental health conditions there. So I think this is one of the areas that we're only scraping the top of the iceberg in analysis at the moment. And it's gonna be an area that gets looked closely at in analysis over the years to come, particularly bringing it together with all of the other variables that we've talked about in the census. The other new question that we asked in the census was a question about service in the Australian Defence Force. So this question asked, um, do you currently serve in the Defence Force or have you previously served in the Defence Force and have you served in the regular services or in reserve services? And a real passionate supporter of this question has been the Department of Veteran Affairs, who obviously have a clear mission around supporting their former service and people. And they, they know the people that they serve, but they don't have a full understanding of the veteran um, community. And they're, they're just wrapped by the fact that we've started to, to produce this picture now in the census. So to, in Queensland, 3.2% um, of the Queensland population are either currently serving or have previously served. Um, and that's made up of 23,000 currently serving and 140,000 previously serving. So this 3.2% compares with 2.8% across Australia. So a slightly higher proportion of a population. And one of the key centres of this, unsurprisingly for, for Queenslanders, is Townsville. So five and a half thousand people currently serving in Townsville, Malaverick Barracks um, and RAAF Townsville, the Air Force. But also uh, a lot of people who have left for services still live in Townsville. So Townsville has the largest previously serving um, community in the country at 8,661 previously serving people. So this means that in Townsville, oh, one in 11 people or about just over 9% have um, served or previously served compared to 2.8% across the country. So a really important and significant part of it, the Townsville community. Um, Former servicing, serving community, other big communities in Queensland are, are Toowoomba with five and a half thousand former service people, Ipswich Inner, um, 4,200 and Bundaberg with, with 3,400. So quite big former service um, populations. And we're currently serving um, the, the Gap Inogra and the Ipswich area, both with around 2,000 and um, currently serving members. Okay, stepping on to households and families, as we say at the ABS, you can't choose your family, but you can count them. And so to looking at the households in Australia, we, we break them up into these three kind of categories. We, we see that there are family, there are households, which are just group households, unrelated people. That's a small proportion of a population, only 4% of households. There are households where people are living alone. That's about one in four households in Queensland. And then there are family households, um, which make up the vast majority of households in Australia, some 71% of households. Now, how does Queensland compare to Australia here? Well, slightly less likely to be in a lone household, about 1% um, and to each point less, and slightly more likely to be in a both a group and family household. Um, and compared to last census, um, the, the number of lone ho person households though has increased by 1.2% since 
in Queensland, mainly at an expense of people living in family households. And so let's drill into a family household, given we have the biggest um, proportion of households in, a, in Queensland. And so we counted um, nearly 1.4 million families in Queensland. And of those families, about two in five have children, two in five are couples living without children, and 17% are, are lone parent families. And so the... Um, Remembering here, though, that couples with no children, and, and that's been increasing, the couples with no children. Couples with children in the last 25 years have dropped from about 52% in Queensland to 41%, and the couples with children have grown during that period of time, but by a similar margin. But couples with no children aren't necessarily couples that have never had children, but also includes your, your empty nesters, so couples where children have now left home and moved away day, day from home, and so now are just living as a couple without children anymore. And if anyone knows anyone and has any tips, please let me know. I've, I've still got kids at home. And if I've got any way of, of having an empty nest, please let me know. Um, stepping into an area, at a particular uh, family structure, which we are seeing more significant changes in in the census. So this is the, the couple, the count of um, same-sex couples that were counted in the census. Remember a census, doesn't ask about sexual orientation and doesn't collect data on, on couples that are living across multiple households. Um, it only counts for, for couples and relationships within a household. So oh, to all of our, our statistics on couples and relationships are a subset, a part of the total picture. But for, so here we can see a Queensland, a third line along there, about 14,888 same-sex couples, not about, 14,888 same-sex couples, um, of which um, 10,200 reported being in de facto relationships and about 4,700 reported being in registered marriages after the change to the marriage law in 2017. And so Largely, this picture reflects population size across the country. Probably more interestingly is looking at how the, the count of same-sex couples has changed over um, censuses. So this is again a, a picture for Queensland. So there's the 14,888 on the right-hand side there. Um, an increase of some 77% since 2016. So a huge increase, much higher than the increase in population and a 40% increase between 2016 and 2011. Um, the number of same-sex couples counted increased by about 68% across us, the whole of Australia. So it's increasing faster in Queensland. And about 30% of same-sex couples have reported a registered marital status. Um, enough from me and families. Back to Caroline, some data on dwellings. Thank you, Duncan. Yes, so the last little bit of the data that we are going to present today is on uh, dwellings, and then we'll be opening it up for your questions. And we are seeing a lot of questions come through, but if you want to, to ask any questions about anything that you've heard in the last couple of segments, then flick them through now and uh, we'll be having them put to us shortly. So let's talk about the dwellings in which Queenslanders live. And first of all, looking at the, the tenure type, so how we're paying for the dwelling that we are living in. And we've got the three broad tenure types here. We've got in Queensland, 29.1% of people, or sorry, of dwellings are owned outright. 34.4% are owned with a mortgage and another 33.1% are rented. That pattern has shifted in, in the last five years. So we have seen a big decrease in the proportion of dwellings that are owned outright. It was 33.7% only five years ago. That's dropped down to 29.1% uh, in 2021. Slight increase in the owned with a mortgage from 337 to 34 .4. And that's due to you know, all the extra dwelling stock that has come on in the, in the last five years. Let's look at that over, over time. 
And here we are actually looking at numbers of dwellings. The previous slide was on proportions. Now we're just looking at the number of dwellings to really reflect what's happening with the dwelling stock. And this is over a longer time period. So this is over a 25 year time period back to 1996. And if I look first at the dark orange bar, that is the number of dwellings that were owned outright. And we can see that in 1996, that was about 460,000. And it has increased, the number have increased to 20. 2021 to about 543,000. You can see it's not been a, a great increase in the number of dwellings that are owned outright. The really big uh, growth has been in the number of dwellings that are owned with a mortgage. Um, so more than doubling there of the number of dwellings now that are owned with a mortgage and also a continued increase in the uh, proportion of dwellings, sorry, the number of dwellings that are being rented. You've probably seen some um, commentary in the media about unoccupied dwellings um, because uh, with our housing situation right now across the country with quite limited supply, um, there's been quite a bit of commentary coming out of the census about the number of unoccupied dwellings that we, that we see around the country. So what we've brought up here is just um, some numbers on the proportion of dwellings that were unoccupied. And I'm comparing here Australia to, to Queensland. If I look just in 2021, the, num the percentage of uh, dwellings unoccupied was 9.6%. And Queensland was a bit below that at 8.8%. .8%. Just note that scale there doesn't start at zero. Uh, so the difference there is magnified. But we can see fewer um, fewer dwellings, proportion of dwellings were unoccupied in Queensland compared to Australia. And compare that back to the previous census in 2016, much higher proportion of unoccupied dwellings in Australia at 10.5%. And also the Queensland proportion of unoccupied dwellings was much higher in 2016 than it was in 2021. So it's worth understanding why dwellings might be unoccupied. They're not necessarily dwellings that are ready to move into uh, right away. So if they're not sitting there vacant waiting for a tenant to come in. That does make up some of them, but they can also be dwellings where there are people who own a couple of dwellings. They might have a um, house in in the suburbs and then a holiday house um, up the up the coast. So on census night, the family was probably in one or other of those those dwellings, and the other one was was unoccupied. There are also situations where dwellings have been newly completed and haven't yet been moved into. Uh, so that will make up a proportion of the unoccupied dwellings and also dwellings that are about to be demolished. Um, so they, they can be lived in, they're considered to be habitable, uh, but they're about to be demolished. So there are a range of reasons dwellings would be unoccupied on census night. So I thought that was worth just clearing up there with some numbers. Now we look at dwelling structure. So we've got so much information on the census and it's not just about the people and the families, but also about the dwellings that we, we live in. And what we're doing here is looking at the Brisbane um, dwelling structures compared to the rest of Queensland. And here we've just broken down into the, the dominant colour, the dominant bar is separate house, that dark green bar in 2021 in both Brisbane and rest of Queensland and also in 2001 for Brisbane and rest of Queensland, most people are living in separate houses. But what we can see over time is an increase in proportion both in Brisbane and rest of Queensland of people living in semi-detached or townhouses. And also right at the top in that peachy colour is people living in flats or apartments that are more than the four or more storeys. Duncan did mention earlier that from 2021, we are now collecting data on nine or more storeys. I haven't pulled that out in this chart because we didn't have that comparison in uh, 2001, uh, but we can see that there's been a big growth in the number of dwellings over the last 20 years that are in four or more storey blocks. Final slide that we've got today on data is looking at some income 
and housing costs and how that's changed in the in the last five years. So starting first, we've got the two income figures. We, we calculate or we present income about personal income and the median personal income on a weekly basis has grown by 19.2% in Queensland over the last um, five years. That's about twice the rate of inflation. Another measure that we have on income is uh, household income. So not just an individual's income, but all members within a household or who are earning income, add that up and how has that changed? And in Queensland, that's also gone up by nearly nearly 20% in the last five years. And we, we capture data on how much people are paying for the dwellings that they're living in and the rent has increased as well. So looking at median rent that people are paying again on a weekly basis, that's gone up just ahead of inflation in the last five years to $365. And I had to double check this number on median mortgage repayment. It hasn't changed. Um, so how people reported in Queensland their median monthly mortgage repayment hasn't changed in the last five years. It's still $1,733. is worth uh, noting that when we talk about mortgage repayments, what people report on the census is how much they are actually paying off their mortgage. So in recent years, until, until quite recently, we've had lower interest rates. So some people may be paying off above their minimum monthly um, repayment requirement and um, so that will be reflected there. So it's not showing how much people are required to pay, but how much they have actually chosen to pay off their, their mortgage. So that is all the, um, oh, sorry, that's all the data. I'm now going to talk about what, what comes next and how you can find out some more information for, for yourself about census data. So what we've presented today is just some of the data that's available from our first release. Our first release came out on the 28th of June. We've covered a number of the topics, not all of them, but we have covered quite a number of the topics in the presentation today. And there will be more data coming in October. And I think the October release is going to be really interesting this time because we're going to see data about labour force. Uh, so that includes things like how many hours people were working, uh, their occupation, their industry, um, how they got to work or whether perhaps they didn't actually go to work, maybe they were working from home. And so really looking forward to seeing what that story is about the uh, number of people who are working from home on census night last year and how that might look different across the, across the country. And we also have um, something else that will be really uh, good, look, really looking forward to, is what we call internal migration. And that's where people have moved from. Uh, so we, people who are currently living in Queensland, where did they live one year ago? And where did they live five years ago? And that will help tell a lot of stories about how, how Australia has changed and how each state has changed. But that's all to come in second release. And then we keep releasing data as we go into um, 2023. We've got some more complex products that we release in 2023. So we've got the socioeconomic index for areas, which is measures of advantage and disadvantage, homelessness, and um, the distance people travel to work, uh, Australian long census longitudinal data, and also some remoteness areas. So that's all to come next next year. What we were aiming to do today was give you a little bit of a teaser of what was available within our first release and let you know where you can get more data if you've if we've whetted your appetite and you want to find out some more, um, certainly direct you to, to our website. We've got a page that's called Find Census Data and you can now find census data either by topic or by area. Previously, you could just search by, by area. So we've introduced this page that is census data by topic. So if you're interested in cultural diversity, for example, and I covered a lot about cultural diversity today, but if you're interested in that topic, click through onto that link and you can get some data and links to other articles that have been written about cultural diversity topics.
or what a lot of people tend to be interested in when they are looking at census data is their local area. So we, we talked about SA3, so we did mention some suburbs today, but mainly we're trying to focus on Queensland as a whole. But if you want to know what's happening in your local government area, maybe your electoral division, maybe your suburb, uh, the search census data tool allows you to input that, um, that geography and you can either bring up what we call a quick stats, which is nicely summarised, high level data of everything you want to know about that area, or community profiles, which are more, more detailed um, spreadsheets with lots and lots of data for, for that area. So it would encourage you to, to have a look at on the website. I will mention uh, the Table Builder product because I'm sure many of you are users of Table Builder and you are keenly awaiting its its launch. Uh, Table Builder is a tool that allows you to construct your own table so you can drag and drop into it the different rows and columns to cut and dice the, the data as you like. So we haven't been able yet to release the 2021 census data on Table Builder. Previous census data is available on Table Builder, but 2021 isn't just yet. We are working really hard to get that out to you. And so we're aiming to release that before we release the next lot of data in October. But we have got a page within the Table Builder section of our website that gives the update on uh, when we might expect that release. So I can't confirm a date yet, but just saying we're working really hard to get that out to you uh, by the next release and would encourage you to just keep an eye on that page on our website because that is where we will be posting updates. And the final thing that I'm going to point you to is a tool that I think is fantastic on our website. It's the Census Dictionary. And we've done a complete revamp of the dictionary since the previous census. And the, the Census Dictionary lists all the variables of, we is are available from from the census and it defines them it talks about the scope so what population uh, does that um, variable refer to some some questions are only asked of people aged over 15 for example and it tells you about all the different categories that uh, the variables are output in it's got snips of the questions that um, were used to form the variables, how the variables changed over time, which is really useful uh, to know how the question might have been asked in a different way. So really good to understand if it's changed over time. And we include data in the dictionary on the item non-response rate. So Duncan spoke right at the start about the number of people uh, who were the, the undercount, how many people were missed in the census. We do also find that some People don't fill in every single question on the census form. And the dictionary is where you can find out what proportion of people didn't answer a particular question. So that is a really useful tool that I encourage you to look at. Enough of our talking. I'm going to open up for questions now. And what I'm going to do is introduce Tanya Hornick. Uh, Tanya Hornick is, um, works for the ABS and is outposted to Queensland government. So what that means is she's hosted by Queensland Treasury to really support Queensland government on um, everything they want to know about the ABS. And Tanya's certainly a keen supporter of the census as I know Queensland Treasury are. So Tanya, I'll pass on to you to uh, lead us through the questions. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Duncan and Caroline for a really exciting presentation. Um, and some great insights into Queensland. And with over millions of data points, there are certainly a lot of stories to tell and yet to discover. So I'm going to let you take a breath, but we all know that, or many of us know that population estimates were released at the same time as the census. And we've also recently had regional population population estimates released as well. And one of the questions that we have is how does the latest rebased 2001 census estimated resident population figure differ to the 2021 census place of usual residence figure? What's the difference in definition? So Carolyn, I might throw to you if that's okay to answer that one. <laughs> 
Thank you, Tanya. Yes, I will take that. And I won't go into too much detail because I am not a demographer, so I'm certainly not an expert on the estimated resident population, the ERP, but I have looked out some numbers. And first I'll tell you broadly what the concept of ERP, um, estimated resident population is. It's basically looking at how many people did we count in the census um, and at their place of usual residence, um, adding in the, the migration and people who are overseas on census night, they get added back into the estimated resident population. So as Duncan said at the start, we've had fewer people overseas for the last census, but people who are overseas, remember when you come back into the country, you fill in one of those um, immigration cards that gets added back onto the census count. And then obviously the net births and, and deaths. So the numbers between the ERP and census data are different and we have really focused today just on census data and all the breadth of information that's available for census data is all about where people were counted on census night, not including those people who were overseas. So the numbers when we look at it are a little bit different. Uh, when we look at the census uh, usual resident count for Queensland, it was 5.156 million. The ERP as of December last year, so a few months after the census, was 5.265 million people. So there are differences between ERP and census. What ERP is used for is a lot of, um, I guess, administrative matters. So when electoral boundaries are being redrawn, that's on the basis of ERP. When funding is being distributed uh, from the Commonwealth, say GST funding, that's on the basis of ERP. So that ERP figure puts back in the people who are missed, but in ERP, because we, we didn't go to all those people with a comprehensive survey of the census, you can't get the breadth of information that um, is available for the census. So I hope that that covered that that one off. That's about the extent of my knowledge on, on ERP. Thank you so much, Caroline. And before I actually let you take a breath, um, I will actually just follow up with a question because you talked about how the ABS had treated the sex question, male, female, non-binary. Is how Do you know how that will be included in the estimated resident population estimates? Or yeah, that's a really good question, Tanya. What I said was that we collected data for male, female and non-binary, but then we're only releasing data for male and female. And what I didn't say was that all those who responded with a non-binary sex option in the census, we actually derived either a male or female for, for those responses. So for people who filled in the census form and they perhaps selected, for example, non-binary sex and also selected female, then for the purposes of most census data, we would have um, derived a variable of um, female for them. For those that only put non-binary sex, then we had a random allocation process to uh, work out whether they'd be included in census estimates as male or female. And so what uh, the census estimates are then what uh, flows through to uh, inclusion in ERP. So the ERP only starts with that binary variable of male or female. The ERP doesn't have any information on the people who, who responded with non-binary sex. That is just something that we've got within the census and we'll be releasing some analysis on in the in the next couple of months to explain how people responded to the sex question in the 2021 census. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, Duncan, I might let Caroline have a little bit of a, a take a breath for a second and maybe grab some water and I'll ask the next question to you if that's okay. So you actually talked about long-term health conditions. Um, Caroline touched on the cultural and linguistic diversity, but I was actually wondering, is there data about long-term health conditions and cultural diversity? And was there an interesting story in Queensland that may have emerged in that space? Good question, Tanya. And um, as I covered in my presentation, I do think we're only 
right at the top of the iceberg of the analysis of a long-term health conditions data at the moment. Um, in our community profiles, we, we do do some cross um, tabulation between in some of the um, yeah, areas of birth. So countries of birth grouped up um, by different regions of a country by long-term health conditions and presence of long-term health conditions. Um, so yeah, you can jump in there today and look at that both at a Queensland level, but right down to, to sort of small area, uh, suburb kind of levels across the, across the state. Um, one of the things to keep in mind though, when you're looking at for long-term health conditions by uh, different um, uh, different countries of birth or, or different ancestry groups is often um, people with a different country of birth for, of a particular country of birth will have quite a different age profile to the population overall. So it, um, there's been um, significant recent migration from Iraq into some areas of, of Queensland. And so to, that's sort of a younger kind of population. And so if you looked at that group, you'd see a lot lower reporting long-term health conditions, but that's probably just reflecting the fact that they haven't, um, they're not old enough yet to get some of the long-term health conditions, which become more prevalent with, with age. And so it, uh, it is something where you always need to look at it in terms of um, the age, age, and also, we haven't mentioned much today, look at it in terms of sex. We do have some differences in sex in terms of health conditions. Um, but sorry, Tanya, I don't have a direct story about a particular a cultural group in Queensland. That's okay. Thank you, Duncan. There's a lot to explore and maybe that country of birth view that Caroline talked about in the search data will help people discover more. Um, so thank you. My next question is actually around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the increase. And um, the question centres around the data quality from the census. And would it be fair to say that the perceived population growth or propensity to identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander in the uh, census is partly due to greater quality from the census? Or is there another explanation? I might start by answering that that question. And I think there are a number of contributing factors to what increase we are seeing in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Queensland in, and in Australia um, altogether. We will be releasing uh, early next year a publication that will really get into that detail and explain where the changes uh, were, what, what drove the changes. So a component of the change is just uh, normal demographic factors. So if we look at birth, the extra births, take away some deaths and net overseas migration, that is contributing to a growth in the number of people who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. We also do see that uh, when we look at the relationship status of people who identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, quite often, and it's an increasing pattern, that quite often relationships are formed between someone who identifies as Indigenous and someone who doesn't identify as Indigenous, their children then um, often are identifying as Indigenous. So we see the growth that way as well. Some people are also just identifying for the first time. And I think we can all reflect on, on the community and what I've heard of talking with uh, people who, members of the community and people who participate in the census was that there seems to have been a greater sense of pride or um choice, really wanting to identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander in this census. And when sometimes you talk to people going back many years who have chosen not to identify, they they felt that it wasn't something they, what they wanted to do. So there probably has been an increase in people identifying as well. And then the question got to, to data quality. And I think that does contribute to to it. So when we've got a higher rate of people participating in, in the census, then we're getting more people filling in the questions. Uh, so that is contributing. But I will point out another measure that we, we didn't talk about, and that is uh, the undercount of people with an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, Duncan mentioned right at the start that we had seen 
a good increase in the undercount for Australia, but what we've seen for the undercount of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population is not much shift in the last three censuses. So it's still around about 17.5% undercount. So quality is probably part of the picture, but not the full picture. That's a great answer, Caroline. Um, for, for one extra piece that I'll add to that mix is that um, in understanding the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community in Queensland, second release will be really important where we get for the internal migration data. So where did someone live one year ago or five years ago? And that will help sort of explain and show have, have people moved around within the state or have has there been a, a net incoming migration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders from, from the Northern Territory or for other, other jurisdictions. So, so we look forward to that data, which will be released in October. Thank you both. A lot to come in October and we, we might talk about that a little bit later. Um, is there any breakdown of top migration countries into Queensland or, or where people have come from and their cultural background? I might... Um, throw to you, Caroline, in the first instance for that one as well. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. So I did cover the common countries of birth that people were arriving from a uh, from to arrive into into Queensland and saying that the pattern is quite similar to what we see in the rest of Australia, but being dominated by New Zealanders. So what you can do um, is look at any of those countries of birth and ask more questions about people who are born in that country. And so if we're looking at cultural background of say people born in New Zealand, and I've just had someone do some quick numbers for me now. Um, I mentioned that New Zealand is the top country of birth for Queenslanders at just about 4% of the population and over 200,000 people. So we can drill into that and have a look at their, their ancestry, for example, and we see that the most people who are born in New Zealand living in Queensland identifies an English ancestry at over 50%, a Scottish ancestry or Maori, uh, so about 18% of New Zealanders living in in, a, in Queensland identify as, as Maori. And then we can look at their languages that they speak and English is the dominant one, but there's also Samoan and, and Maori. So it, there are many different ways that you can look at that breadth of cultural diversity data. I will plug something that's happening in second release as well. It seems like we can't answer many questions right now because everything's happening in October. But I, I did briefly talk about the quick stats product that uh, quick stats tool that's available to us now. One thing that we release in October is a country of birth quick stats, which means that you can go in and select your country of birth, uh, sorry, select the country of birth that you're interested in, select the region that you're interested in, and then get all, a whole lot of summary census data uh, sliced and diced for that country of birth. So I've just gone in and had a look at the 2016 figures for, for New Zealand, and I can see all information about when they arrived in Australia, their educational attainment. Um, when we get to this release, we'll also have their health and their defence force, citizenship, religious affiliation. So that allows you to not only look at data by region, but also to look at it by your country uh, of birth. And I just picked on New Zealand uh, today because that is the one that is the highest other than Australia uh, in Queensland. Just to add a little bit to, to Caroline's insights there, um, it, our, our community profiles, which are available now, do give you a country of birth by year of arrival table in there. So you can look at a, um, it, for different and um, countries these, these that have arrived. And one of the ones which stands out for, for me is that there's quite a, a large Indian population has arrived in in Queensland over the last five years, so over 23,000 um, new usual residents of Queensland with a country of birth in India. That's nearly a 50% increase in that community from, a, from, a, from the point where I was at in, in 2016. And so very fast growing community. And that's something that we've seen nationwide as well, where um, India has moved as the, up to sort of second place as a country of birth outside Australia. Thank you so much to both of you. I know, Duncan, that you said that if you 
were to set the questions for the census, you would probably say over a thousand, right? But there's um, interest now in what might come for the 2026 census. And I was wondering if you would mind explaining how the ABS is going to choose what questions will go on the 2026 census, please. Yeah, absolutely. More than happy to. Um, the, so to, we see the census as being Australia's census. And we ultimately, whilst uh, I, I joke about all the questions I'd like to ask, um, the questions we ask are the, the questions chosen by the Australian people through their elected officials in government. And so we go out to the public um, through a public consultation process. Um, so it's something that we run for, for government. So we'll go out, out in early next year and ask for, for public submissions on, on the, the next census. So would you like any new topics? Would you like um, any changes to existing topics? Um, do you have, are there any topics that you don't think there's high value of anymore? And we, we ask you to put in a submission explaining what the need of that topic would be and providing us some detail about that. Because we need to, we always get lots of submissions. There's always lots of um, great ideas for new topics on the census. We have to work out, could you collect it on the census? Does it make sense to collect it on the census or is that data available in other sources? Would it be better to collect in a survey? And so we go through quite a rigorous process to try and work out what we think there is a big need for and what would work in a census. We then and put that together and we make some recommendations to the government of a day. And the government then puts a little bit of um, legislation in place to say these are the topics of a census for next time. And so I really look forward to, to hearing what comes up for 2026. Great, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time for any more questions as part of this session. Um, if your question hasn't been answered today, can I ask you to email them into the ABS at client.services at abs.gov.au and we will get back to you with a response. Um, I will actually give a plug, there are more census data seminars to come, um, including some that are actually uh, topic specific. So please uh, stay up to date on our events page. I'll close the session now by thanking our presenters, Caroline Deans and Duncan Young, and all of the people who have helped make this session possible, and to you for putting your questions to us in good spirit. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, remember every stat tells a story. So keeping uh, exploring that census data. Thank you very much.